Planet Earth. Population, roughly 7.5 billion. Every single member of the human race has been born on this tiny blue planet. Imagine one day, everything is going as usual, and then a giant asteroid happens to collide with Earth, and just like that, no more humans. The most advanced species ever recorded, snuffed out in an instant. That sounds rather grim, doesn't it? Extinction events like these are just one of several reasons that humanity has a vested interest in becoming an interplanetary species, and one likely candidate for Earth 2.0 is our neighbor, Mars. Unfortunately for us, Mars isn't exactly a tropical resort. Its average temperature is around negative 55 degrees Celsius, about the same as the middle of Antarctica in winter. Then comes the issue of atmospheric composition. What little atmosphere Mars has is predominantly made up of carbon dioxide, which would prove fatal for humans. Then there's the lack of a magnetic field, which has left the red planet defenseless against the solar winds that have stripped away its atmosphere over time. So it's clearly quite a project, but what would it really take to make Mars habitable? Could we possibly terraform it into a second Earth? Before we get into the how, let's take a look at the why. Why would we want to bother with terraforming Mars? There are several other likely candidates for terraforming, such as Venus, Europa, and Titan. But since Mars is our closest neighbor, it's currently the most feasible. Extinction events aside, there are a handful of reasons creating a backup home planet might be useful. Remember that population count at the beginning of the video? Well, it's growing very quickly, and many people fear that there will come a point when the Earth simply can't sustain such huge numbers. It's hard to say what that number might be, or if it even exists at all, but the range of estimates for Earth's carrying capacity are anywhere from 4 to 16 billion. So, we could have a long way to go, or we could be living on borrowed time. Whatever the case may be, having a planet that could support life could ease the strain on Earth's resources, at least for a little while. Another benefit of the massive project would be the wealth of scientific knowledge that would inevitably stem from the challenges we face on Mars. Things like artificial gravity and large-scale ecodomes are two likely candidates, since both would probably be needed for long-term success in colonization. Other potential advancements could include more efficient transportation to and from Mars, new farming techniques, and medical treatments born from the prolonged effects of living on Mars. Now, on to the how. There are four main issues that need to be addressed in order to make Mars habitable. First, raising the temperature. The current average of negative 55 degrees Celsius is too cold for prolonged exposure. Second, increasing the atmospheric pressure. Its current pressure is too low to sustain liquid water, and without water, Mars can never be truly suitable for human life. Next, changing the composition of the atmosphere to allow humans to breathe safely. This would require supplementing or replacing much of the CO2 in the atmosphere with oxygen to make it less toxic for humans. And finally, protecting the surface of the planet from radiation. Since Mars has no magnetic field to speak of, it's constantly bombarded by charged particles from the sun, which would be harmful to would-be colonists and strip away the planet's atmosphere. Fortunately, the solutions to most of these problems go hand in hand. Let's start by looking at what's arguably the biggest barrier, raising the temperature. It's thought that sometime in its past, Mars actually had large polar oceans and other bodies of water. But in the countless years since, the planet's atmosphere has been stripped away, leaving only polar ice caps and large amounts of ice below the planet's surface. The main strategy for raising Mars' temperature is to release huge quantities of greenhouse gases, which will gradually warm the surface, melt the CO2-rich ice, which in return releases more greenhouse gases, warming the planet more, and so on until the polar ice caps have melted and become oceans. There have been several suggestions of how best to kickstart this greenhouse domino effect, and some of them seem downright laughable at first glance. One early idea was to set up factories on Mars, which would pump out large amounts of greenhouse gases. But the logistics of shipping the materials needed to build such factories all the way to Mars make it cost prohibitive. The other options would be much less expensive, and a whole lot more fun, because they involve bombarding Mars with either asteroids or nukes. Now, blasting Mars with such destructive force is only an option if plans for colonization are several decades or centuries off, because we wouldn't exactly want to set up shop in a radioactive wasteland. But the idea isn't ridiculous. Many asteroids contain ice rich with ammonia, which has the potential to be a potent warming agent when released on impact with Mars. Many scientists believe introducing a large amount of ammonia into the atmosphere would be enough to kickstart a runaway global warming cycle, putting Mars on the fast track for further improvements. Using nuclear bombs is the plan to choose if we don't feel like wrangling and redirecting asteroids. Some Mars hopefuls, most notably Elon Musk, suggest that detonating thermonuclear warheads over the poles could provide a large boost in temperature and help melt polar ice. And, you know, maybe getting rid of some of our weapons of mass destruction wouldn't be such a bad idea. One final, less destructive method of melting the polar ice caps would be to position giant mirrors in orbit near Mars to concentrate rays from the sun. Of course, this would take much longer and not be nearly as fun as nuking another planet, but if environmental preservation is the objective, mirrors are a good option. Once we have a more habitable temperature, we'd have to face the task of producing oxygen for humans to breathe. There are several ways of achieving this. 
First, and most expensively, we could simply ship gas canisters full of oxygen, or pumps that could produce it. Such an endeavor faces the same problems as establishing factories on Mars, it's just too expensive. That's where plants and bacteria come in. Scientists are currently working on a project that would send special bacteria or algae to Mars that could use Martian soil as fuel to produce their own oxygen. Depending on how efficient these organisms are, they could either be deployed over the entire planet's surface and left to their own devices, or we could establish smaller biospheres in which colonists could work on various projects, including farming and producing oxygen for use outside the domes. After many years of oxygen production, possibly helped along in the future by more advanced production methods, the biospheres would become unnecessary, and the air on Mars would be breathable. Finally, there's the challenge of Mars's lack of a magnetosphere. In order to deal with the destructive solar wind, we'd have to create some kind of artificial magnetic field. While this goal will be very difficult to achieve, it also holds the possibility of being the single most effective way to replenish the planet's atmosphere and kickstart the natural processes required to become habitable. In late February of 2017, NASA scientist Jim Green suggested that deploying a magnetic dipole field between Mars and the Sun could allow the planet to recover from countless years of solar bombardment. This field would require a super powerful magnet with a strength measured at 1 to 2 Tesla to be positioned in L1 orbit. Green's research paper proposes that if such a magnetic field could be deployed, within years Mars could achieve half the atmospheric pressure of Earth. With a proper atmosphere in place, frozen CO2 at the poles would begin to sublimate, warming the climate, ice caps would begin to melt and form oceans, and we could potentially see a habitable Mars in the reasonably near future. Of course, even if we started terraforming Mars today, we wouldn't see the results tomorrow, or in a year, or even 10 years. But if we want to secure humanity's future as an interplanetary species and reduce the odds of total extinction events, we've got a lot of work to do. As always, I've provided links for further reading in the description. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and follow Second Thought on your favorite social media, or just drop in and hang out on the official Discord server. You can watch my previous video by clicking here, or watch them all by clicking here. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.